Hello. So this is another decolonization story, this time not from the USA, but from the august heights of the Welsh Arts Council. And it's all to do with this man, Sir Thomas Picton, whose full length portrait, goodness me, judging by the tightness of those britches, I can well understand why he had a reputation for a bad temper. Uh, no, but look, I know we're not supposed to notice things like that on account of it being art. But, well, ladies, when was the last time you saw Rudolf Nureyev and didn't notice something more than his magnificent calf muscles? Anyway, this portrait, until recently, hung in the National Museum of Cardiff, and now they've taken it down to decolonize it. I have no idea how you decolonize a portrait, uh, but quite frankly, I reckon it needed to be taken down as an outrage to public decency. Here's a more civilized picture of him. So, Sir Thomas was a great hero during the Napoleonic Wars. As I said, he was famed both for his volatile temper and his intrepid bravery. He died fighting in the Battle of Waterloo, leading at the head of a bayonet charge, and he probably saved hundreds of lives by stopping a, a French attack on a particularly crowded group of soldiers on the Allied side. Uh, he rose not from the aristocracy, but the respectable middle classes. His family lived apparently not on a country estate, but in a house in the centre of a small town called um, Haverford West. Uh, it might be pronounced differently in, in Britain. Uh, I always used to tell my students, if you could... Uh, say a word, missing out as many of the letters as you could without actually making it unintelligible, then you should do that. So Haverford West might actually be pronouncing something like Howest, but I don't know. I've never been there. Anyway, he joined the army as an ensign when he was around 14 years old and he shipped out to Gibraltar when he was around 16. And while he was there, so that was sometime between the age of 16 and 17, simply by dint of his own personality, which was quite strong, even as a teenager, he put down a mutiny. I'm telling you this to give you a background on the sort of man he was. Personally brave and absolutely ruthless, and a soldier when he was 14. At one point in his career, he was uh, Lieutenant Governor of Trinidad, which had previously been a Spanish colony or territory, and it was uh, not only still subject to Spanish law, but it was constantly under threat from the Spanish who were trying to get it back. There was also a constant threat of insurrection, from the uh, citizens, residents or natives or whatever you might wish to call them. And he prevented uh, any sort of public disorder by meeting any stepping out of line with determination and brutality. He traded in slaves, as did many, and he became very rich on that. But eventually he clashed with the aristocrats who were coming in with the self-assurance that comes with having a privileged and wealthy childhood. And, and they decided that Picton's often cruel and uh, arbitrary government was just not on anymore. And he was indicted, actually, for, for having a young woman tortured, or at least authorising the torture, because she was suspected of aiding a lover in the crime of burgling the house of the man she was living with. And he was sent to trial twice on that. Uh, his defence was that under Spanish law, the sort of torture he inflicted on the woman 
was both an established practice and absolutely allowed. Uh, he wasn't imprisoned in the end, but he was out of the lieutenant governorship and he ended up joining Wellington's forces in the Peninsular War. It seems he expected from himself no less than what he expected from the people under his command. And when uh, he, he was killed, as I said, and when Wellington wrote his report to the Minister of War, this is how Wellington talked about him. Your Lordship will observe that such a desperate action could not be fought and such advantages could not be gained without great loss. And I am sorry to add that ours has been immense. In Lieutenant General Sir Thomas Picton, His Majesty has sustained the loss of an officer who has frequently distinguished himself in his service and he fell gloriously leading his division to a charge with bayonets by which one of the most serious attacks made by the enemy of our position was defeated. As I said, he probably saved hundreds, maybe even thousands of lives. And when they found his body, it turned out that he'd suffered a serious musket ball wound during a previous battle and he told no one about it, not even his servant. And he bandaged it up himself and must have been in tremendous pain and carried on. There's no doubt he was an unpleasant man, but it looks like he was, as I said, as demanding to himself as he was to others. So there was no hypocrisy in the way he acted. And so I don't see any reason not to have that portrait as an example of a British hero, a British hero with different morals, but still a hero. And then you will, could say to me, well, what would you think of a statue, for instance, or a painting in honour of some Nazi? And my answer to that is to remind you that there was an American movie about the attempt of Klaus von Stauffenberg to assassinate Hitler. He did it because he wanted to save his beloved Germany from the depredations of a madman. But before that, he fought in the Nazi army. He's on record as having very anti-Semitic opinions and seems to have had no problem at all uh, with what was going on in Germany while he was supporting the government with his military talents. He fought bravely for Nazi imperial ambitions. But as bad as he was, he risked and then paid with his life to accomplish one supremely honourable act. It wasn't for the Jews, but for the sake, as I said, of his beloved fatherland. So yes, he was a hero. And Tom Cruise even made and starred in a film about him. So what's the difference between him and Picton. Frankly, there isn't any. And if there's one thing I find thoroughly objectionable, it's when soft, modern denizens of centrally heated flats, safely working from their padded chairs in art gallery offices, whose nearest approximation to a moral choice is whether it's better for the environment to put almond milk or soy in their lattes, they're the ones deciding that this man isn't worthy to have his portrait hung up in one of their bloody museums. Why not treat yourself or a favoured relative or friend to these magnificent examples of merch? The mugs and t-shirts come in the Granny Opteryx design or Grambo with a firearm or the more deadly knitting needles. Go to www.grannyopteryx.com and whatever platform you're watching this on, please click like, subscribe and share, share, share.